commemorate the first non-stop Atlantic flight, the greatest air race ever held. And for the fastest times between London's post office tower and the Empire State Building in New York, 60,000 pounds in prizes. 50 years ago, Alcock and Brown were the first to break the transatlantic barrier. Now, Anne Alcock, niece of the aviation pioneer, is the first competitor to leave. With 21 prizes to be won, the race inspired all sorts of travel alternatives. Sterling Moss went by bike, chopper and scheduled VC-10 flight. Record breaker Sheila Scott typifies the pioneer spirit of the thing. She was flying the Atlantic solo in her Piper Comanche, a plane which already holds 67 world records. Mary Rand went the first part of the way by underground, a somewhat complicated combination of train, car and charter plane to New York's Kennedy Airport. same flight as Mary, burly broadcaster Monty Modlin, who made an unscheduled touchdown into the Thames foreshore. <laughs> to quote Lord Byron, my native land, good night. Lieutenant Commander Boke snatches a catnap before leaving. The service entries stood the best chance of becoming overall winners. One of the RAF victors, which were making two attempts in each direction, takes off from Wisley, RAF station, bound for New York. One of the victor competitors, speeding now towards the Empire State, is Flying Officer Bill Fuller from Witten, RAF station, Huntington. After his flight in the category Chartered Business Jet, Sterling Moss looks jet-propelled himself. Comparing notes with Flying Officer Fuller. Meanwhile, he was going down at 1,200 feet a minute in the express lifts for outward-bound competitors from New York. Not all of them shared the same sense of urgency. classes for business and professional interests, as well as for jet pilots and solo flyers. Bowlers and brodies at the Empire State. Impeded by other competitors, Mary Rand struggling to save vital seconds on her time. When the Daily Mail first announced the challenge of an Atlantic race, they couldn't have imagined the enthusiasm they'd inspire or the variety of people who'd take part. One competitor even entered blindfold. Here he's arriving in London, Commander Bill Martin, a US Navy helicopter pilot. He claims to have a sixth sense that allows him to see in the dark. In spite of a fall into the Hudson River, he put up a tremendous time, seven hours, 21 minutes for the whole trip. But the fastest times of all were being put up by our service competitors. You literally couldn't see them for dust. The Harrier Jump Jet, piloted by squadron leader Leckie Thompson, set one of the best times in the race and made history as well. The first ever fixed-wing aircraft to operate from any city centre. The squadron leader's time, 6 hours, 11 minutes, 57 seconds. Of course, the RAF's chief worry was the Navy and their record-breaking phantoms. This was the dramatic tire-bursting landing at Wisley, which nearly brought disaster. With the tires in flames, Commander Borrowman had to fight to keep it on the runway. The competitor on board the Phantom, Lieutenant Paul Waterhouse. The aircraft was to regain the world record from America for the New York to London route, but that record was only to last four days. 
Then another phantom chopped more than 10 minutes off the time with just four hours, 53 minutes and 10 seconds. <laughs> Lieutenant Waterhouse, the first phantom competitor, was beaten by 11 minutes, tower to tower, by his fellow Navy adversary, Lieutenant Hugh Drake. Clement Freud goes Aer Lingus to New York with 10-year-old Dominic Folder. Mr. Freud intended to take his son, but I'm told at the last minute he wanted to go somewhere else, if you see what I mean, and missed the flight. Over in New York, one of the Harriers takes off to welcome another arrival. It was the biggest day of the whole week, officially named by New York's mayor, QE2 Day. of the Daily Mail race and the arrival of the world's most sophisticated passenger ship combined to make this the biggest prestige occasion for Britain for years. Back on the Empire State, Tina the Chimp. After her flight with BOAC, Tina made the most of her vantage point on the highest building in the world to keep an eye out for the rest of the competitors. Back home at Farnborough, Christine Turnbull, the first girl to cross the channel by balloon, chose the same method to get to London Airport. But it ran out of gas after only 10 miles. Neville Samuelson flew his own Spitfire, but his radio was to fail and fuel trouble forced him down in Pembrokeshire. Finally, one of the great solo flyers of all time arrives in New York. After two days without sleep and desperate hours while her plane iced up, Sheila Scott broke her own Atlantic record by five hours. Certainly her performance symbolizes the whole purpose of the enterprise and reflects the courage of those early aviation pioneers. A tribute to the past as we come to the threshold of supersonic passenger flight.